nation what are the implications on uh, this uh, of these decisions on the economic part or uh, the economic or uh, the budget uh, of a country for uh, the year uh, year 2023 2024 uh, this is actually what we're talking about if you are just joining in you're most welcome and we're going to continue the debate with uh, mr kane presley now the question I want to direct to you, sir, is like how does this decision, you know, by the World Bank contribute to a broader uh, discussion on, on the, uh, the, the responsibilities of international organizations in uh, addressing human rights, as, uh, of course, human rights, you know, uh, like we earlier said, a country is actually acting on its own moral principles and how it will want to define its own uh, society. But then, uh, since we said uh, the world is changing and, and the perspectives are actually changing, let's look at uh, the, the role of these international uh, organizations in addressing uh, aspects which they consider to be a violation of uh, human rights and how, ca how can uh, these organizations actually shift uh, from uh, maybe uh, uh, linking uh, the, the, the decisions or the, 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 the internal legislation of countries and of course uh, the, the engagement on other aspects of like, uh, for example, uh, funding or lending uh, for development projects. Um, thank you once more, Clarice. Um, um, the word as it is um, leans on, on a document the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This, this document has been codified and enacted by many nations in the world, including Uganda. But what we find today, uh, what we find today and what we experience in the world today is the notion that I like to call double morality double morality, um, where, um, where we have documents, sometimes I even founding documents of organizations, but then I like to say that we are in a predatory world. We're in a predatory world where um, uh, documents, norms, and laws uh, are generally um, and usually are violated by, by countries that have an edge on other countries. And then it brings back the whole idea of sovereignty and independence of nations, which is also, which are also idealistic uh, um, uh, notions, because in reality, we, we have to espouse uh, the theory of realism where um, I like to say we're we, we 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 in some kind of a jungle where we experience predation of each other. Uh, having said that, um, the way uh, the, the, the behavior of, of international actors on the global scene um, uh, is, is um, is permitted by the whole idea of power. And I would say that to, to, to engage this world, to engage this world, to take decisions like the World Bank is doing today, uh, we must uh, be in a position of power because it is said states are equal, that is idealistic, but in reality, they're not equal. We must be in a position of power and, and, and we can only access uh, power if we have the strategy of power. It's only through strategy that we can uh, unlock multi-dimensional power. And that is what is gravely, gravely missing on, on the African continent. As my co-panelist uh, said moments ago, he gave uh, succinct examples as uh, Saudi Arabia or the Middle East where you find uh, countries that have very stern LGBTQ uh, plus laws, but 
countries that are unperturbed by the West or the Western institutions because they have, they have the financial uh, uh, power to roll back whatever sanctions come to them. And he, he, made a, he gave an example of the World Cup where it was a whole brawl about, about the limitations of human actions during the World Cup competition. But the, 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 this country's uh, Qatar was unperturbed and the World Cup was a success. And now we have uh, Western players uh, flooding into Saudi Arabia and Qatar to play football, irrespective of the stringent laws in those countries. Is to tell you that when you are, when you when you have when you have the tool of your beating, when you have the tool of your beating, um, sanctions uh, from the World Bank uh, cannot cannot face you out, and it brings it brings us back to 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 us as the people of Africa, uh, 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 to question not only our institutions but also our governments. Because it's my conviction that um, the era, the era of, of strong men in the African continent, the, the, the era of, of the Mandelas, of the, of the Nyereres, of, of the Nkrumas, uh, are gone. And we, we, have it, we find it so hard uh, for, for these men, this kind of man, a man of, man of caliber to be, re, to be reborn on the African continent. We find it so hard to, to bequeath an international, uh, in, international institution that are worthy of us as a people. Because today, uh, what we experience, and, and the question we have to ask ourselves is how, how, we could, uh, how we could be unfazed by Western sanctions, how we could be unfazed by Western interventions, how we could be unfazed by Western paternalism? That's the fundamental question. And the, 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 we, we cannot keep coming on, on weekends on African Afri media and crying foul to what comes to us. Because when, the, when, when, it's, when it becomes too repetitive, then it's, it becomes too, uh, and then it becomes worrisome at the same time. Um, today, uh, it's so shocking that the conflict or the coup d'etat as, as it is happening in West Africa does not have, uh, does not come with a resounding voice from an African institution like the AU. It's disturbing that the sanction of the World Bank does not receive a statement from a body like the African Union. And then it tells you that we get to the realization that it's just an empty box without a, without a shared voice, without a political statement. Because we, no matter, no matter how we try to interpret the laws in Uganda, we are in the face of um, a, country, a country whose sovereignty is being attacked. And sovereignty is a political thing. We expect that the people of the, the, the leaders of the continent under the, under, the, under the umbrella of the African Union could be able to put out a voice and say, no, this is an attack of a sovereign state. And probably call Yuri Museveni behind closed doors and tell them, hey, brother, as much as the sanctions are hard on your country, we think that you've gone too far. But it's not existing. It's the same thing happening in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in, in Niger, where we have the only, the only international uh, uh, organization that has under its umbrella all its countries is the most successful political organization which has all its countries under an institution. But it's sad to know that 50, 54 countries are unitedly divisive, where there, is no, where there is no one common voice. And then you ask yourself, because today we're talking about Uganda, tomorrow we'll be on another debate talking about another African country. And then it brings you back it brings you back to it to to the notion of autonomy, because today we have we have to deal with the Bretton Woods institution. Of course, the IMF is a Britain, the World Bank is a Britain, it's a Britain Woods institution. Years ago, we had Gaddafi, who had Gaddafi, who sold a dream, who sold a dream to the entire continent, that of that of a uh, uh, birthing 
an African Development Bank, which would secure us from financial independence from these bodies. What did we do? We let him go on his we let him go on his uh, on his on his on his offer and almost saw it as a vanity offer. We let him we, we sold him out to the West because it's the continent that sold him out to the West. We sold Gaddafi out to this to the West. And today, Libya has become a corridor for, for, for African immigration. Today, and today we are crying foul. We are crying foul when the World Bank is meting out sanctions on a country as Uganda. It, 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 it's it, the, the whole question of us as a people. I, I think there's a lot of us watching this program now. We need to start questioning ourselves as the African people what we really want. How long are we going to sit behind uh, TV programs and cry foul and say Africa? We, we can't keep crying for long. We can't keep crying for long. It's time to birth not only leaders, but institutions. It's time to, um, uh, to uh, um, birth new mentalities, because the biggest problem in Africa today is not wars, it's not corruption, it's the mentality. It is the mentality. I, I always say Africa is in a mental side. It is, it is a mentality. And once we would be able to format, to all, format the African mind, then we would understand that as much as you want to uh, sell out our notions or values as polygamy and call it an African value, you should be able to know that no one deserves to die because they choose who to love. So it's, it's double standards. And as much before condemning LGBTQ, you should be able to sell polygamy and tell them that. And to sell polygamy, you should be financially stable. You should be economically stable. You should be politically secure. And it's when you have all these ingredients that you start talking of sovereignty. You are not sovereign when you keep begging. You are not sovereign when you have sanctions and say you turn to new partners, and those partners are not Africans. There is no, it would never, it would, I would never clam or clap for any African country who would drop France, who would drop Britain to have Russia and China. No, you don't, you don't, you don't open, you don't invite a double, a second scramble for Africa. You don't invite it. The next wave. The next wave after slavery, after colonialism, after post-colonialism, should be an African unity, as propounded by Mandela, as propounded by, by these people who paved the way. So today, I am not subscribing to uh, verbal idealism. It's time to take action. It is time to behave in a way that our children our children should inherit of 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 of, of Ndosa land, of Tanzania, of these countries that are so beautiful, but that are so sacrificed by leaders, some of whom we did not choose. So we cannot keep we cannot keep making an outpour week week in week out about our about our. Um, about our suffering state, because we're not suffering. We have it all. We we have we have a lot on the African soil and on the African soil. We cannot we 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 cannot predict on our people, and then expect and expect to be clapped for. It, it it's time to say enough. It's time to revisit the visionaries, the dreams they had for the continent. It's time to question ourselves why, fifty four nations a fight when Gaddafi was being ducked out from his village in Sirte and killed. It is time to question ourselves why the heroes of the past, as Thomas Sankara was murdered. It is time to ask ourselves a lot of questions, but more importantly, more importantly, it is time to speak in a shared voice, one diplomatic voice, one economic voice, because as much as we want to look at ourselves divided, uh, uh, a European in Germany, when he meets me on when he meets me on the streets, he would first call me African before calling me Cameroonian. 
So that's the reality. We are, we are put in the same box and we have to act accordingly. And it's only by acting uh, in, a, in a united front, building institutions that are able to protect us against these coercive methods that we can engage the future and bequeath a better promise for our children and our children's children.